So again, welcome to Bhakti Sangha Japa conference call. Uh, we are very fortunate to have His Grace Nitya Krishna Prabhuji here with us today. And Prabhuji will be enlightening us by walking us through Srimad Bhagavatam 4.11.13 onward. Um, thank you so much, Prabhuji. Danvar Pranam. All glory to Srila Prabhupada. And thank you for giving us uh, your valuable time and association this morning. I would like to hand over the call to you now. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, everybody. Let me get that my humble relations to you. All the relations to you. Om Nimo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Nimo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Nimo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Narayanam Namaskrita Nadamcheva Narottamam Devim Sarasvatim Vyasam Tato Jaya Mudiriye Nasta Prayashu Bhadrishu Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya Bhagavati Uttama Shwoke Bhaktir Bhagavati Naishtiki Hare Krishna. So, thank you for this opportunity today. I beg the blessings of all the assembled Vaishnavas here so that uh, we can have an enlightening discussion today on this most glorious Srimad Bhagavatam. So today we'll be discussing uh, um, fourth canto, chapter 11, text number 13. And the title of the chapter that we're discussing is Swayam Bhuvamanu Advises Dhruva Maharaj. So I'll just read the, uh, the Sanskrit and the word for word and translation and purport. Chitikshaya karunaya maitra chakila jantashu samatvena cha sarvatma bhagavan samprasiddhati. Chitikshaya, by tolerance. Karunaya, by mercy. Maitra, by friendship. Cha, also. Akila, universal. Jantashu, unto the living entities. Samatvena, by equilibrium, cha, also, sarva atma, the super soul, bhagavan, the personality of Godhead, samprasadati, becomes very satisfied. Translation and purport by His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Shila Prabhupada. Shila Prabhupada ki jai. The Lord is very satisfied with His devotees when the devotee greets other people with tolerance mercy, friendship, and equality. Purport. It is the duty of an advanced devotee in the second stage of devotional perfection to act in accordance with this verse. There are three stages of devotional life. In the lowest stage, a devotee is simply concerned with the deity in the temple, and he worships the Lord with great devotion, according to rules and regulations. In the second stage, the devotee is cognizant of his relationship with the Lord, his relationship with fellow devotees, his relationship with persons who are innocent, and his relationship with persons who are envious. Sometimes devotees are ill-treated by envious persons. It is advised that an advanced devotee should be tolerant. He should show complete mercy to persons who are ignorant or innocent. A preacher devotee is meant to show mercy to innocent persons, whom he can elevate to devotional service. Everyone, by constitutional position, is an eternal servant of God. Therefore, a devotee's business is to awaken everyone's Krishna consciousness. That is his mercy. As for a devotee's treatment of other devotees who are his equals, he should maintain friendships with them. His general view should be to see every living entity as part of the Supreme Lord. Different living entities appear in different forms of dress, but according to the instruction of the Bhagavad Gita, a person who sees all living entities equally, such treatment by the devotee is very much appreciated by the Supreme Law. It is said, therefore, that a saintly person is always tolerant and merciful. He is a friend to everyone, never an enemy to anyone, and he is peaceful. These are some of the good qualities of a devotee. Om Jnana Timinandasya Jnana Jnana Shalakaya Chakshuro Mimitam Yena Tasme Shri Guru Venamaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bishtam Tapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swapadantikam 
ವಂದೇಹಂ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರೋ ಶ್ರೀಯುತ ಪದಕಮಲ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರೋನ್ ವೈಷ್ಣವಾಂಚ ಶ್ರೀರೂಪ ಸಾಧುಗಾತ ಸಹಗನ ರಘುನಾಥ ಅಂಬಿತ ಸಜೀವ ಸಾಧ್ವೈತ ಸಾವದೂತ ಹರಿಜನ ಸಹಿತ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಚೈತನ್ಯ ದೇವ ಶ್ರೀರಾಧ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಪದ ಸಗನ ಲಲಿತ ಶ್ರೀ ವಿಶಾಖಾನ್ವಿತ ಹೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಕರುಣಾ ಸಿಂಧು ದೀನ ಬಂಧೋ ಜಗತ್ಪತೆ ಗೋಪೇಶ ಗೋಪಿಕಾ ಕಾಂತ ರಾಧಾ ಕಾಂತ ನಮೋಸ್ತುತೆ ತಾಪ್ತ ಕಾಂಚನ ಗೌರಂಗಿ ರಾಧೆ ವೃಂದಾವನೇಶ್ವರಿ ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ಹರಿ ಪ್ರಿಯೆ ಪಾಂಚಕಲ್ಪ ತ್ರೂಭ್ಯಶ್ಚ ಕೃಪಾಸಿಂಧು ಬೇಬಚ ಪತಿತ ಪಾವನೇಭ್ಯೋ ವೈಷ್ಣವೇಭ್ಯೋ ನಮೋ ನಮಃ ನಮೋ ವಿಷ್ಣು ಪರಾಯ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಪೃಷ್ಠಾಯ ಭೂತಲೆ ಶ್ರೀಮತೆ ಭಕ್ತಿ ವೇದಾಂತ ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ನಿತಿ ನಾಮಿನೆ ನಮಸ್ತೆ ಸರಸ್ವತಿ ದೇವಿ ಗೌರವಾಣಿ ಪ್ರಚಾರಿಣೆ ನಿರ್ವಿಶೇಷ ಶೂನ್ಯವಾರಿ ಪಾಶ್ಚಾತ್ಯ ದೇಶ ತಾರಿ ಜೈ ಶ್ರೀ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಚೈತನ್ಯ ಪ್ರಭು ನಿತ್ಯಾನಂದ ಶ್ರೀ ಅದ್ವೈತ ಗದಾಧರ ಶ್ರೀ ವಾಸುದಿ ಗೌರ ಭಕ್ತ ಬೃಂದ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ 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 ಹರೇ 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 ರಾಮ ಹರೇ ರಾಮ 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 ಹರೇ 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 ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಅವನ್ once again thank you for this opportunity to discuss with all the wonderful assembled devotion of us this most glorious shrimad bhagavatam the ripened fruit of all vedic knowledge its participation in reading of shrimad bhagavatam daily is one of the five most potent angas of devotional service and by following this wonderful practice we can have some hope to awaken our pure love of god So I'll read the verse again. The Lord is very satisfied with his devotees when the devotee greets other people with power, friendship, and equality. So just a little bit of context for this verse. We have been studying this pastime of Dhruva Maharaj now for some time. It's quite an elaborate pastime that's being described here. Um, and we can understand the amount of time uh Shukadev Goswami dedicated to this uh describing this pastime indicates its great importance for us and Dhruva Maharaj has now taken over the throne the king Uttanapada has handed over the the kingdom to his son his very qualified son and Dhruva Maharaj has been ruling um and in the prior chapter we understand that Dhruva Maharaj's brother was slain in the forest and now Dhruva Maharaj in the mood of a Kshatriya is going to avenge the, the death of his brother and so he has began to fight very ferociously uh, against the Yakshas in the northern region of, of the Himalayas and in, in, in conducting his battle he being very qualified and very very skilled is creating quite a quite a havoc in 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 the enemy's uh kingdom and is destroying just many many enemies and so the great um swayam babu manu the grandfather of dhruva maharaj has come and is now speaking to dhruva maharaj dhruva maharaj is hearing the instructions of Swayam Babu Manu, and this will continue for many verses uh, in this chapter, virtually to the end of this chapter, actually to the end of this chapter, in which uh, Dhruva Maharaj is receiving instructions on his conduct in this battle to avenge the death of his brother. And so, in this section of Bhagavatam, and in this chapter particularly, there are some very nice themes that, that are being discussed here. Uh, and I thought I would touch on those in general, and then we'll dig into a couple of them in particular. One here is about violence um, and its application. And we see in the Bhagavad Gita that Arjuna is being encouraged to fight, even though he is facing the prospects of fighting against uh, relatives, great seniors, even his guru, that uh, 
that violence has its place. And Krishna was explaining that there are the, you know, the aggressors who must be dealt with. And he explains how actually by Arjuna destroying the, the opposite side in the presence of Krishna is actually very, very beneficial because, because of the, uh, the aggressive activities of Duryodhana, he is going to suffer greatly for those sinful activities. And Arjuna, by taking his life in the presence of the Supreme Lord, is actually freeing him from many of those reactions and opening the doors to the, to the spiritual world for Duryodhana. So we see that in this case that the violence has a very proper ap al um, application. And so the Manu Samhita speaks about when violence should be used. And a Kshatriya has a responsibility to protect society. And at times, there is a need for disruptive forces in society to be removed from society. Violence may not be the first option, but it certainly is uh, a recommended option if no other means is, is available to remove this disruptive force in society. And so, you know, we, we see that uh, uh, Guru Maharaj engaged in violence to avenge the death of his brother as uh, a rightful aspect of his duty as a Kshatriya. And now Swayam Baba Manu is, 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 is advising him, you know, you've gone too far in the application of this violence. So uh, violence has its place. And I'm reminded of, you know, this pastime with Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Thakur, um, once he was giving class in, in Shimayapur Dam uh, at kind of the headquarters of the Gaudiya Mutt there at the Chandrasekhar Bhavan. And he was sitting on the Vyasasana and a cobra had come from the forest and come right up to the Vyasasana. And some devotees had arisen to, you know, take care. And, and Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati put his hand up telling them to stay back and just let it be. And this cobra came, actually offered obeisances, and then slithered away. And, and, and Bhakti Siddhanta Thakur took a very you know, calm approach to the presence of this snake. And then we know in reading uh, some of the discussions from Srila Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada explains another pastime at this same location, not exactly where Bhakti Siddhanta Thakur was giving class, but in that same complex, that Srila Prabhupada was there and another snake had come, and Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasi Thakur was on the balcony just above, and Srila Prabhupada looked up at him and looked back, and he was in a precarious position, and immediately Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasi Thakur ordered that snake to be killed. And so, you know, we can see that in one instance, Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasi Thakur took a very, um, you know, tolerant approach and, and let the snake be, and in this case, to protect his, his disciple, he was willing to take the life of that snake. And so the application of violence, again, must be very, very carefully considered and, uh, and, and done according to Shastra. So that's one important uh, theme we see here in this section of, of Srimad Bhagavatam. The second important uh, point that I, I wanted to discuss is, is, is the importance of guidance in our life we see that Swayam Babu Manu has come and to give Dhruva Maharaj advice. Now Dhruva Maharaj is very uh, qualified to rule the kingdom and had learned many, many things through his upbringing, yet he still was in need of advice. And so we see the importance of feedback and we'll discuss that um, in, the, in, in, in more detail in this, in this chapter. And then the other comment or theme we see just from a couple prior verses uh, in verse 11, uh, he says, it is very difficult to achieve the spiritual abode of Hari in the Vaikuntha planet, but you are so fortunate that you are already destined to go to that abode by worshipping him as the supreme abode of all living entities. So Swai so Mbogu Manu is encouraging Dhruva Maharaj that he should protect this great fortune. Uh, it is a great fortune, and we and we must protect it. So, um, so today I wanted to talk about two of those themes, and one more uh, specifically related to this verse. 
Um, so today the three topics I'd like to cover. One is protecting our fortune. Um, you know, we, we have heavy duty safes, we have banks, we have locks on our doors. Why? Because we use these things to protect things that we value, to protect our fortune. So we can discuss today a little bit about what fortune we really have and how we can protect that great fortune. The second topic I'd like to discuss is this aspect of Soyam Babu Manu coming to guide Dhruva Maharaj. You know, following instructions and taking guidance as we progress in the path of devotional service is very, very important. The more we advance, actually the more guidance we need. Yet often the tendency is for the opposite to be, that now I understand and I don't need, you know, so much guidance. So we see the importance and we'll see at the end of this chapter how Dhruva Maharaj responds to the counsel he's getting back from Sangin Bhagavan. And then finally, the third topic that we'll discuss today is the very wonderful qualities of, of the devotee that are being described here. Uh, tolerance, mercy, friendship, and equality. These great qualities that manifest in the devotee. Uh, last time I spoke, we, we discussed the different uh, qualities Krishna describes of his pure devotee in the last few verses of the 12th chapter. And we saw many of these this will discuss that. Um, so let's first start again back with the first topic here, which is protecting our fortune. So Ayambhuva Manu again is encouraging Dhruva Maharaj. He's had this great fortune to have direct darshan of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He's achieved the process of pure devotional service as being instructed by Narada Muni. He's achieved the Guru. And so he should be very careful with this fortune. So what is the meaning of fortune? Fortune is something of great value, something that is rare to achieve, at least in the material world, its rarity indicates value. Right? Diamonds are rare, they're not found on the streets, and so they have value. So fortune is something that has great value. And we know, what do we do with anything that we have acquired that is of value? We protect it. We put our money, which we have great value on, we put it into a bank to protect it from the thieves. We have locks on our doors in our home so that we may protect all of the contents that we put value on. We have seat belts in our car. Why? To protect the valuable passengers. So in this way, we have all these things that we, have, that we put value to, and anything that we have, find of value, we protect it. You know, I, I don't think anyone with any intelligence has ever gotten into their car and taken a, 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 a bag of garbage and put a seatbelt to it and drove it around. Why? Because we have no value for it. And so we don't protect it. So ultimately, we protect what is valuable to us. And sometimes in our devotional service, we, you know, we may lose sight of the great value we have in devotional life, and thus we may not be as protective of this great asset that we own. So that is really the next logical question. What is our greatest wealth? What is our greatest riches? What is it that we should protect? If we're not going to protect you know, the trash in our home, what is it that we should really protect? Is it our money, our home, our reputation, our family? So, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu presented this question to Ramananda Rai. And he asked, of the many capitalists who possess great riches, who is the topmost? And Ramananda Rai replied, he who is richest in love for Radha Krishna is the greatest capital. So he's indicating to us that the greatest fortune we can have is this love of Radha and Krishna. And so that is actually our only real fortune. To have come in contact with Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's movement by the unimaginable mercy and compassion and tolerance of Srila Prabhupada, we have now this greatest of fortune to awaken this love of Krishna in our heart. And that we must now take very great care of and great protection of this great fortune. Knowing 
how valuable it is, this process of devotional service and what we have, two things should manifest. One, it will make us very sincere in enhancing that value, enhancing that fortune. And two, it will make us very careful in protecting it. So sincere and enthusiastic to carry forward this great fortune we have, and also very, very careful to avoid anything that may destroy this great fortune. And so we see in Chaitanya Charitamrita that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu teaches over and over and over again so many pastimes of the importance of protecting our devotional service. You know, he explains that our bhakti, it is like a creeper, a vine. And a vine grows. It may grow for many, many, many years, yet it remains very fragile. It's very thin. And with a, a quick snip of scissors, it can be cut. And our bhakti is like that. We may be in devotional service for many, many years, but it is fragile. And so Chaitanya Mahaprabhu recommends that we protect our creeper of bhakti by putting a fence around it. And that fence around our bhakti is the association of devotees. And the association of devotees can help us in protecting our great fortune, this devotional service. And actually, our only misfortune is Durdeva. We chant this in the Shikshastakam prayer every morning. Durdeva. I have no attraction for the holy names of the Lord. We may make a long list of misfortunes. This person doesn't like me. My bank account is not full enough. My back is hurting and this is happening and my hair is falling out and all these things we may claim to be our misfortune. But our only real misfortune, our only real durdaivam is our lack of attachment to chanting of the holy name. So if we can understand that, it can inspire us to work to dissipate this misfortune and enhance our actual fortune, which is this process of awakening this love of God. So Swayam Bhagavanu is, is encouraging Yuva Maharaj to protect this great asset that he has acquired. And that brings us really to the second topic, which is the importance of having that association around us. Those who can guide us on the path of devotional service those who can protect us. Um, you know, following when we're new in devotional service is very easy. You know, when we first come to the temple, we know nothing. Somebody in front of us puts their hands up in the air, we put our hands up in the air. Somebody bows down after blowing the couch, we bow down after blowing the couch. After, after, so after everyone says key, someone says J, we say, okay, we follow. Like that, we follow. But as we progress in devotional service, we, we tend, the tendency develops that, okay, now I know everything. Now I'm okay. And we see that Dhruva Maharaj actually had the right to think, wait a minute, what Swayam Bhagavan can tell me? What my grandfather can tell me? I have personally seen the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He has touched his conch to my head and enlightened me completely. Now what am I missing? Yet we see the mood of the great devotee Dhruvaraj that he understood that no, though he had made great progress in devotional service, that he needed to hear the great advice of his grandfather. And so he kept a very open heart to the advice around him. And if we look at the character of, of, of our great Acharyas, we see this over and over and over again. This staunch following of instruction of the greatest devotees around them. You know, Srila Narutam Das Thakur also had the great fortune. He was given Krishna Prema directly by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had deposited Krishna Prema in the Padma River and told the river, you hold it, because in the future, many years from now, my great devotee, Narutam, will come and when he comes to take bath in this river, you give him this Krishna frame. And Narutam came to the Padma River one day and he took bath and he, he became overwhelmed with love of God. He achieved the perfection of life. 
Yet, when the instruction came to him to go to Vrindavan and take initiation from Lokana Swami, Narutam Das Thakur left home immediately. He was the son of a great landholder, you know, lived a very comfortable life, and he endured the great austerity to travel by foot through the dense jungle to reach Vrindavan Dham, following the advice that came to him in a dream from Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself. He already achieved love of God, yet he was followed. And we know when he approached Lokanath Swami, he was rejected. And Narutam Das Thakur was not to be deterred. He remained enthusiastic to follow that instruction. And so began to render very, very menial service to Lokanath Swami. And after seeing this very humble and dedicated service, Lokanath Swami gave initiation to him. And after giving initiation to him, he told Narutam, now you go learn from Jiva Goswami. And Narutam Das Thakur went to study under Jiva Goswami. Again, following the instruction. It's the same person who was personally given Krishna frame by Lord Krishna himself. is still following. We see the past times of Rupa and Sanatana Goswami. They so badly wanted to join the movement of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. When they met at Exchange. They were expressing their great humility to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu so strongly and broke. But when it came time for them to join the movement, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu instructed them, you go to lost places of playing all the wonderful festivals and ecstatic kirtans. But Rupin Sanatana Goswami followed that instruction, took it as their life's mission and perform great service that we are all benefiting from today. If we have the opportunity and great fortune to go to Vrindavan, it is by the great efforts of led by Rupa and Sanatana Goswami that we can actually see Vrindavan today. And 500 years ago it was lost. So like this we see the great character of devotees is that they continue to follow. And Dhruva Maharaj is, is, is cheering very, very nicely from Swayam Bhavamana. And sometimes in our devotional service, you know, we try to put ourselves in situations where, oh, I want to do this service. Everyone will leave me alone. I can do it my way. Or I'd like to kind of do this activity because no one is there and I can just do it the way I want to do it. And that can be a dangerous tendency for us in practicing devotional service because no matter where we may have come to, there is always an opportunity for us to make mistakes, to deviate. And so we need the tender, loving care of great devotees in association who can guide us and who can protect us from such pitfalls. And so we'll discuss a couple of those pastimes from Chaitanya Tretamrita that, that exemplify this very important process. So the third topic we're going to discuss today now is this, the wonderful Vaishnava qualities. In this verse, we see that, that the Lord is very pleased when his devotees are tolerant, merciful, friendly, and have equality. Okay. So Srila Prabhupada is commenting in this purport, so we'll get a little bit technical here for a few minutes, uh, just to, dis to discuss what Srila Prabhupada is presenting in the purport, and then we'll come back to a couple of pastimes to help show these qualities in practice. So the Prabhupada comments that the, it is the duty of an advanced devotee in the second stage of devotional perfection to act in accordance with this verse. So there are three stages of qualification of pure devotees. Uh, and these stages are evaluated on two metrics. The first is what is the degree of our faith? And the second is the extent of our knowledge of Shastra. Based on these two, the degree of our faith and the knowledge of our Shastra, it determines what level amongst these three levels we may be situated. The highest level is the Uttamadikari, 
And then we have the Madhya Madhikari, which is being spoken of specifically in this verse, and then the Kanishta Adhikari. So the Uttama Adhikari, he has pure faith that Krishna Prema is the absolute only goal of life. So he has full, undaunting faith. And he also has complete knowledge of Shastra. His knowledge of Shastra is so extensive that he can debate anyone and defeat them with the reference of Shastra. So this is the qualification of the Uttama Dikari. Pure, full faith, and full knowledge. And such an Uttama Dikari can become a guru because they can guide on the basis of Shastra and overcome anyone's doubt. And Bhakti Vinod Thakur says that you can see in Uttama Dikari by how many people they can bring to Krishna consciousness. He says their presence alone can make people chant Hare Krishna. You can see Srila Prabhupada just sitting in Tompkins Square Park, just chanting how many people he engaged and sparked a worldwide revolution in chanting of the Holy Name. Still today, you walk in the street of any town and if you have a bead bag, someone will recognize and say, Hare Krishna. That was what Srila Prabhupada did. But he engaged so many people. And this is one of the measures that Bhakti Vinod Thakur gives. Now, an Uttama Dikari actually to preach, though, has to come down to the Madhya Dikari level. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a second. So the second level of qualification is the Madhya Dikari. This person has very, very strong faith. They're very fixed in their devotional service and will not be swayed but yet they're developing knowledge of Shastra. They are not yet conclusive in their understanding of Shastra to be able to convince others. They themselves are fully convinced, but they are not maybe able to yet convince others. And the third level of qualification for the pure devotee is a Kanishta Adhikari. Here, one's faith is very weak or pliable. It means there is still potential for them to become deviated if they associate with the wrong individual. Their faith is still developing. And their knowledge of Shastra is also very, very limited. So that while they have faith and they have begun to engage in pure devotional service, it is still, we can say, in the formative stages. So this is the Kanishtya Adhikari. Again, the two metrics by which we evaluate where one might be, one is the degree of faith, and two, the level of knowledge of Shastra. So each of these individuals meet various personalities in different ways. So the Kanishta Dakari, he can only see Krishna in the temple and thus sometimes can create a very unsettling situation when he interacts with devotees. He does not see the devotee as also part and parcel of Krishna. He does not see that being a representative of the message of Krishna. And so he'll offer respects in the temple but not to other devotees. And sometimes this Kanishya Dikari can become in an offensive way. And there are innocent Kanishya Dikaris and there are also non-innocent that have an envious nature uh, due to their Mayavad philosophy. But that is how they interact with others. And now the Madhya Medikari, which Srila Prabhupada dedicates the purport to speaking about, discusses how a Madhya Medikari interacts with various people. So with Krishna, he shows great love to those who are very are senior to them, they offer ovation to To those who are their peers with, they make friendship. And to those who are innocent and subordinate, they show great compassion. And to those who are envious, they avoid. So this is the, the mood in which a Madhya Madhikari interacts with various people. And we see actually in the material world, we take the opposite approach. To those who are subordinate to us, instead of being compassionate, one will often take a very, very oppressive or aggressive mood to take advantage of one's weakness instead of showing compassion. To one who is senior to them, instead of looking to learn, one becomes very envious and tries to pull them down instead of trying to elevate to good association. And to one's peers, 
instead of making friendship, they embark in competition. So we can see that sometimes this even spills over into our spiritual life. You know, and so, but the Madhya Madhikara we see very nicely possesses these great qualities that Srila Prabhupada is describing. That they should be very tolerant. They should show mercy to persons who are ignorant. Even to the innocent, not to the envious, if they give difficulty, want to tolerate. This is the characteristic of the, of the Madhya Madhikari. And the Uttama Dhyakari, they see everyone as part and parcel of Krishna. And so they are extremely um, merciful and loving to all. And they also have extraordinary humility. What makes it difficult for the Uttama Dhyakari to actually preach is a very interesting phenomenon. That the Uttama Dhikari is so humble that he sees himself or herself as more fallen than anybody. So they cannot find anybody to preach to. Because out of their humility, they see that everyone is more advanced than themselves. And thus, Srila Prabhupada explains that in, in, uh, a guru or spiritual master while on the Uttama Dhyakari platform actually comes down to the Madhya Madhyakari platform to understand how to interact with various people, to be able to spread this message that he has himself understood with deep faith and fully understood through Shastra. So, a couple of the characteristics we can discuss. Mercy. You can see that the devotee is full of compassion. Their pain, a devotee's pain, is felt by seeing the pain of others suffering in this material world. A devotee is not pained by their own difficulties, by their own challenges. A devotee has such mercy that they are pained seeing others suffer. And we see this with Srila Prabhupada. You know, that so much effort he went to, he was driven by such a compassionate mood, seeing the suffering, that even his own difficulties he was willing to tolerate heart attacks, strokes, extreme austerity, sometimes nothing to eat, sometimes not even his own safety is assured, yet driven by this mood of compassion for the suffering of others, he was ignoring his own pain. And this is the characteristic of, of a great devotee. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, don't preach this message to the envious. And Srila Prabhupada comments in the purport, but the devotees are so merciful that even though Krishna is saying, don't waste your time with the envious, they'll even try to spread this message to those who may be even innocently envious. This is the compassion of the devotee. And we'll see in one of the pastimes we'll narrate here in a minute, how the devotees are even more merciful than even Krishna himself. Tolerant, another great quality of devotees. Srila Prabhupada writes, I quote, one's greatness has to be estimated by the ability to tolerate provoking situations. I'll repeat that again. One's greatness has to be estimated by the ability to tolerate provoking situation. Our tolerance, a small delay in a flight, a boss says something to us, a mosquito comes and bites us, our spouse doesn't greet us in the appropriate way, the neighbor's music is too loud. How much tolerance we have for these things? How do we react? Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says, do not be samitena, dororapi, Shahishuna. We should be tolerant like a tree. A tree exhibits great tolerance. If you go up to a tree and say, hey tree, you're ugly, still it will give you shade from the sun. Still it will give you a very nice fruit. If you kick the tree, still it will give you shelter. Even if you cut off one of its limbs and burn it just to heat your body, the tree will keep on giving shade, leaves, fruits. 
This is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's guidance to us. We should become very, very tolerant. Prabhupada quote, uh, says in his purport that even to the envious person who may give us trouble, they may criticize or try to stop one's efforts to preach, one should become tolerant and remain steadfast, understanding that this person's nature, due to their conditioning, is leading them to this activity. So Prabhupada comments that the devotee preacher must show uh, mercy and still persevere even to the envious. Here we see great, great devotees like Haridas Thakur, how tolerant he was. He was being beaten in 22 marketplaces, publicly humiliated. Yet what was his mood? Praying for those who were beating him to be forgiven. He was praying. Krishna, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had asked and called for Sudarshan Chakra to come. But because of the prayer, the tolerant mood of Haridas Thakur, those people who were beating him were actually saved. Lord Nityananda was personally attacked by Jagai and Madai. And he took a very tolerant, smooth, and ultimately was able to deliver them. What Srila Prabhupada tolerated, we can never even comprehend. How much he tolerated in his journey to establish this International Society for Krishna Consciousness, for which we are all the extraordinary beneficiaries of. His tolerance, we can see, uh, once I was hearing a, a lecture uh, by His Holiness Bhakti uh, Prasotta Maharaj, and he, and he said, Srila Prabhupada's tolerance is something that has never been seen in the history of our Sampradaya. And that was a very strong statement. But when you start to dissect what he un underwent, it's actually true. And it's very beautiful to appreciate the great tolerance of, of, of Srila Prabhupada. So we see this great Vaishnava quality uh, with him. You know, being friendly, maintaining good relationships with everyone. A devotee has no enemy. Even someone who is giving them a hard time, a devotee sees that. Oh, this person came and slapped me. Oh, they are just an instrument of my bad karma. Why I should slap them back? They're just a mailman giving me my karma that I had planned to deceive some prior act action to be slapped. Maintain friendly relationships. Someone doesn't, you know, engage so nicely with us. No problem. Don't reciprocate. Again, be tolerant. These are the moods of these great devotees. So I thought we could conclude by sharing two stories uh, from Chaitanya Charitamrita that interweave all the topics we discussed today. In these stories, we'll see great compassion and mercy. We'll also see the great importance of protecting our fortune. Swayam Baba Manu, again, is, is, is encouraging Dhruva Maharaj, protect what you have. In Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Chaitanya Charitamrita, we see showing so many pastimes of the importance of protecting our devotional service. So let's, we can discuss two pastimes that discuss, again, this compassion and mercy and the importance of protecting our fortune. When Chaitanya Mahaprabhu reached Puri, we know he, he delivered uh, Sarvabhuma Bhattacharya by um, first hearing from him and then showing him great mercy by correcting him, ultimately revealing his Sadbuj form. And after performing that pastime, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu decided, under the guidance of Sarvabhuma Bhattacharya, to begin a tour of the south and embark upon his southern tour. He went under the guise of looking for his brother Vishwarup who had taken sannyas, who he knew already had left his body. But his real mission was to preach, to spread the glories of chanting the holy names of the Lord. And so Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was preparing to embark on this journey. And this journey pained the devotees, the close associates, to see Chaitanya Mahaprabhu have to endure, endure great austerity, traveling 
It's not like traveling today in airplanes and first class seats and comfortable taxis. This is walking through dense jungles, sleeping anywhere, eating whatever may come available, roots, dry leaves, berries. Very difficult activity. And so the associates of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu were, were pained to see that their beloved Lord was going to endure such difficulty. And Lord Nityananda begged Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, please let me and a few devotees come with you so that we may serve you and, and make your journey as comfortable as possible. This austerity we cannot tolerate to see. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says, no, Nityananda, I have already traveled with you and you fooled me. We were going to Vrindavan and you told me we were following the Yamuna. And we were following the Ganges and we ended up at that Advaita Charya's house. I've already been swindled by you once. A second time I was traveling with you to Nilachal and you broke my ganda and threw it in the river. I'm not traveling with you anymore. In this way, I had a very sweet exchange with Lord Nityananda. Lord Nityananda said, okay, okay, fine, I will not go. But at least take one simple brahmana with you. You have to carry your water pot, you need some cloth, and you will be engaged in chanting, in singing and dancing. Who is going to be able to carry this water pot and, and cloth? You'll be counting on your hand the holy names you're chanting. And so let's say, please take this one simple brahmana with you. And he'll take care of you and he'll not say anything. He'll stay out of your way. But please, at least take one. And so Chaitanya Mahaprabhu finally agreed and he took his Brahmana with him by the name of Kala Krishna Das. And so the two began to travel together through the forest and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, everywhere he went, he was engaging everyone in, please chant, please chant, please chant. Engaging everyone in chanting the glorious mantra, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. And in this way, village to village, whoever he met became imbued with this love of God. And they went back to their villages sharing with everyone what they had learned from Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu carried on, meeting so many great personalities. And along the way, one evening, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Kala Krishnadas were taking rest. And in the middle of the night, this servant became attracted to some gypsy tribe. The women were in the forest and they performed some mystic powers and they captured his heart and mind. And he ran away to them in the very early morning, late night hours of the night. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu awoke and became very upset. Where he has gone? Of course he knew where he went. He's the all-knowing Supreme Personality of Godhead. Don't think that we can get away with anything Krishna doesn't sleep. It's never too dark for him to see what we have done. So he went to retrieve this Kala Krishna Das. And when he went to call him out, the, the tribe, these, uh, this caste of people, they began to attack Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And without even lifting a hand, all the weapons by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's great power turned back on themselves and they were being killed left and right and everybody's first. And he grabbed Kala Krishnadas by the hair and dragged him away from this association. And they returned, continued their travel, and they returned back to Puri. And as soon as they returned back to Puri, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, I'm done. I don't want to see this Kala Krishnas anymore. Do you know what he did? And he explained how he ran away and so he abandoned the association of Kala Krishna. But the devotees, the associates of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, when they saw this, they did not join ship and also abandon Kala Krishna. Das. Their hearts became broken and they showed great compassion. And Lord Nityananda, Jagadananda, Mukunda, and Saurabh Damodar, they engaged Kala Krishna das in service. As Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Name Bhakti Parachati, my devotee, he never perishes. And so they know we know if we remain in devotional service, even if we make a mistake, 
we can become saved. And so the, the, these devotees engaged uh, Kala Krishna Das in a very important service. What do they do? They asked him that you go to Navadvip and you inform Sachi Mata and Shivas Thakur and Advaita Charya and all the associates that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has returned to Jagannath Puri and they may come to see him. What a great service. You can imagine being the messenger of that news. How ecstatic everyone would be. We say when a messenger delivers bad news, don't shoot the messenger. But delivering this ecstatic news, Kala Krishna Das must have been enjoying. So though he had performed such a bad action, the devotees, the associates of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, took a very compassionate view to him. And there are many morals in this story, one of which is this great importance of protecting our devotional service. Even the personal associate of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who is giving Krishna prema to everyone as Mahavadanaya, the most merciful, he fell down. He went away. He became allured by material sense gratification. Sometimes we may think, oh, I'm set now. I've taken initiation. I've taken second initiation. I've done this. Now I'm safe. We can see by this, it is a great warning to us that it can happen to anyone. Srila Prabhupada was once asked, Prabhupada, what is the difference between you and us? And this devotee was expecting some great philosophical answer, some very technical, oh, maybe he's the Uttama Dikari and I'm the Kanishta Dikari. The Prabhupada responded with a simple statement. The difference between you and I is I cannot fall down, but you can fall down. And the devotee was struck. Later that day, they had gone to take darshan at the temple. And Srila Prabhupada, seeing the beautiful lordship, Radha Krishna, was in a very deep, prayerful mood. And this devotee noted how intensely Srila Prabhupada was praying in front of these deities. And he was curious. So when they returned to Srila Prabhupada's quarter, he asked, Prabhupada, you were in a deep mood of prayer. What were you praying to the deities about? Would you mind sharing? And Prabhupada said, I was praying to my dear Radha Krishna, please don't let me fall down. And then the body said, but wait a minute. You told me that you cannot fall down. That was the difference between you and us. The Srila Prabhupada said, now you know why I cannot fall down. Srila Prabhupada was not arrogant in his statement. He was determined to protect his bhakti. He was praying to Krishna, please don't let me fall down. So if this is the prayer of someone of Srila Prabhupada's caliber, how much we should protect our devotional spirit. And if we fall down, we can still be saved. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu could have left Kala Krishna Das with that Dipti tribe and went on in his own. He is self-sufficient, Atmarama, he needs no one. But he went and personally grabbed Kala Krishna Das and extracted him from that association. So we can see that yes, if we do fall, if we remain very humble and sincere, we can also be saved. Krishna personally came and saved them. And then we also see how the Lord's devotees are even more merciful. When Chaitanya Mahaprabhu rejected association, the devotees very intelligently found a way to help that person. You now, if we see somebody struggling in devotional service, we should not find ways to criticize them and in increase their difficulty. Instead, we should see how we can help that person how we can help save them from whatever difficulty that they may be encountering. So the second task that I wanted to share, which carries on again these two themes about protecting our bhakti and the mercy of devotees, I'll just narrate quickly in the interest of time, is this pastime of Tota Haridas. This pastime of Tota Haridas comes in Ankhya Lila. 
It's a very, very beautiful pastime. I'll discuss it quite briefly. But, uh, if everyone desires, they can read this pastime um, in Faith in the Trace. And uh, again, Ampilila chapter 2. It's very, very beautiful. So, Bhagavan Acharya was hosting Sheikh the Mahaprabhu for lunch. And Bhagavan Acharya had, had invited Chotahari Das to come. If Chotahari Das had one nice service, he would sing very beautifully for the Lord. It was very pleasing to Sheikh the Mahaprabhu. And so Chotahari Das was there as preparations were taking place. And Bhagavan Acharya asked Chotahari Das, please go and beg some rice. Please go to, the, to this elderly sister of Shiki Mahiti, uh, Madhavi Devi was her name, and please um, beg some rice from her. Actually, she was uh, uh, explained one of the very intimate associates of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He had three and a half very intimate associates, uh, and this Madhavi Devi was considered half. Uh, Shiki Mahiti was one, Sarov Damodar was two, and Ramananda Roy was three. It's a very, very close associate. So, Chotari Das went and begged some rice from this uh, elderly Mataji. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was honoring the offerings. And he was relishing this rice. And he asked Bhagavan Acharya, this is very, very nice rice. Where did you get it from? And he explained who gave it to him. And um, he um, uh, explained that it came from Madhavi Devi. And then he, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu asked, who, who got it? He said, oh, Chota Haridas went for me and very nicely got it. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu didn't say anything. And then he left and he went home. And when he went home, he told his servant, Govinda, don't let me see Chota Haridas anymore. Govinda was struck. He followed the instruction. When Chota Haridas heard this instruction, this message from Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he was devastated, crushed. His only fortune being this relationship with Krishna. Now Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has said, I'll not see him. And he began to fast. Day, three days. He was not taking any food. So Thorab Damodar and the other associates, out of compassion, what did they do? They went to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And they asked, what happened? What Discretion, what deviation occurred? Please, let us help this Chotari Das. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, I cannot tolerate someone in a round round state who associates with a woman. He says, one should not even sit alone with their mother. Because the senses are so difficult to control. In Srila Bhagavatam, Krishna speaks to Buddha Ji and he's narrating the conversation between the Abhadhut Brahman and Maharaj Yadu, the son of the Yati. Um, and he says that a saintly person should never touch a young girl. In fact, he should not even let his foot touch a wooden doll in the shape of a woman. Even his foot should not touch a wooden doll. This is how much one should protect. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was extremely angry and he left. But the devotees being so compassionate went again to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Please excuse this minor discretion. He begged rice not from a young woman, but from an elderly lady. He was just getting some rice on the order of Bhagavan Acharya. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, if you ask me again, I will leave all of you. Don't ask. They still were determined. And so they asked Paramananda Puri, you go and ask Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, see if you can do anything. But again, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu refused. And he pretended to leave, actually. He was very upset. So the devotees decided, well, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is not going to let go right now. Let us go control Chaitanya Das. And they encouraged them, just give it some time. Let some time pass. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is an ocean of mercy. You'll be forgiven. Just please take some prasad and just give it some time. You see the mood of the devotee. 
They did not abandon Tota. Oh, yes, he is a fallen person. No. Very compassionate. And so they tried to mediate the situation. Even when rejected first, second time, still they continued trying. So Chota Aidas in this way kept distance in the Jagannath temple. He would keep very far distance, just observing his beloved Lord. One year had passed like this. And finally Chota Aidas went to Triveni at Prayag and left his body, committed to it. When Chaitanya Mahaprabhu heard about this, of course he knew, but he still asked, what happened to Chota Harida? And they said, he has committed suicide. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, yes, this is the proper atonement for a saint, a renounced person associating with a woman. Now, we have to understand internally, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was very, very close and intimate with Chota Haida. But externally, he is showing to all of us the great importance of protecting from even the smallest of deviations. Chota Haida, after he committed suicide, how dear he was to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He would come at night and sing, continue this seva of singing to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. No one else could hear, but Chaitanya Mahaprabhu would hear from his dear associate. So though externally he was showing very harsh and firm instruction, he was a very dear associate. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur comments at the end of this chapter. He says, there are seven great lessons from this story. And the fifth lesson, he says, is we can see how extraordinarily dear Chota Haridas is to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Why? Because even for the slightest indiscretion, the slightest deviation, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu severely corrected him. Now you can say, what? For a slight deviation, a severe correction is a sign of love? It is absolutely the greatest sign of love. Because if someone comes to us and can correct us before it gets too big, what greater fortune we could have? Sometimes we wonder, you know, what's the big deal? A small deviation watching this movie. What's the big deal talking about this devotee just once? What's the big deal missing my round today? What's the big deal eating this food that's not been offered to Krishna? We sometimes wonder like that. This gives us some insight and we should be very, very careful because a slight deviation can destroy us. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is teaching us this lesson. That Chotari Das, his offense of begging rice from an old lady was sufficient to break off his association with him. But Jaitanya Mahaprabhu is an ocean of mercy. And Bhakti Siddhanta Sarsh Thakur says that this correction is the greatest fortune we can have. But often what happens is our ego doesn't allow us to receive that mercy. When someone comes and tries to correct us, we fight it. Oh, what do you think, Prabhu? What do you think, Mataji? How I'm wrong. And then we lose this greatest gift. So we can learn from this pastime that, you know, we should be careful of slight deviations. You know, these great forest fires in California, they destroy billions and billions of dollars of so-called fortune. And how it started? From a small spark. A tiny spark ignited a gigantic fire. That is like a small deviation in our devotional service. It can start small, but it can grow like a wild forest fire. We don't protect it. But if we stay in the association of devotees, stay under the protection of devotees, we can then become protected from such deviations. And Dhruva Maharaj here 
is being guided from a deviation. He is, he is carrying on excessive violence. And thus Swayam Bhavamuna was calm to say, Dhruva Maharaj, stop this. Enough. And you can see at the end, the very last verse of this chapter, Dhruva Maharaj received this knowledge, how? With gratitude. This instruction, this correction, he receives with gratitude. He offers obeisances to Swayam Bhavamuna at the end of this chapter, being grateful for this correction. So when someone tries to correct us, let us also try to be grateful for that mercy that is being shown to us because it can protect us from burning our progress in devotional service. So just to summarize, violence, it has its application. <clears throat> we must use it intelligently. We need devotees in our life to guide us, to give us feedback. We should embrace it. We should search it out. We should put ourselves in positions to always be under the protection and guidance of someone who can see things we may not see ourselves. We should protect our fortune. Our only fortune in this life is our practice in devotional service. We should do whatever we can to protect it. Be very, very careful of even minor deviations. And always remember, devotees are very merciful and compassionate. We should become merciful and compassionate, and we should draw upon the mercy and compassion of devotees. Staying under their association, we can protect our paths, protect ourselves in the path of devotion. So with that, I'll conclude. Śrīla Prabhupāda ki jai grantha rāj Śrīmad Bhāgavatam ki jai Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hare Krishna Prabhuji. Very, very wonderful. Nicely, nicely painted the philosophy and also the way how we can um, protect ourselves from the offense, making offenses to deciding. Thank you very much. It's much needed. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Mataji, Dhanava Pranams. Thank you. I don't have a question. Hare Krishna. Any other questions, comments, corrections, clarification? Hare Krishna Prabhu. That was really such a wonderfully given class. Thank you so much. Um, Can you just repeat for me um, what what that evidence you said was there that despite what Chaitanya's heavy chastisement of Chota Haridas, we could see that actually his affection for him was quite deep. I don't I didn't hear what you had said. Yeah, yeah. So Shiva Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasiti Thakur comments in his summary of this chapter he gives seven lessons from this pastime and the fifth of those lessons he says that the, the, the chastisement of Tokyo Haridas is proof of how dear Chaitanya, how dear Tokyo Haridas is to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And the reason is, is that the chastisement and correction is for his purification and protection of his body. So when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is correcting Chota Haridas, it is for his protection of his bhakti. Just like a mother in a home, if, if a child is not doing his homework, the mother will say, do your homework. Sometimes even it has to slap him or do your homework. But if the neighbor's child is not doing their homework, mother won't care. Mother won't do anything. Right? So that chastisement, that corrective action, takes place because of the mother's love for that child. So similarly, taking the mouth of his chastisement of Chukha Haridam showed how much he cared and loved for him because he wanted to protect his devotional service and correct that deviation that he had risked associating with a woman, even though it may seem on the surface to be very minor. And so that we can understand the meaning that Chukha Haridam is very dear. And we know that 
the spiritual master of Guru, when he chastises his disciple, he'll only chastise a disciple that is very dear and close to him or her. Because he knows that otherwise one may not be able to take such uh, chastisement. So that's the ultimate sign of love. Uh, that, that is what is the problem. Okay, Matthew? Actually, uh, um, yeah, this part I had understood, but I thought I had heard you say, maybe I'm wrong, but I thought I had heard you say something else about after um, Chota Haribas took his life, right, his own life, committed suicide, yeah. after that, had you not said something yes, that, yes. that's what yeah. I'm referring to. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, so he, after he left his material body, he came, he continued to perform, so he would come in the night, every night with Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and sing various bhajans for him. That was his service when, when he was in his uh, you know, manifest last times. But he would come you in said, the no, night. I'm sorry, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't hear you say he would see what? He would sing for him. So he would sing oh. various uh, bhajans for him and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu would hear the, the bhajans of Chota Haridas after he had committed suicide. And so we can understand you know, how much love he had for him. So externally he showed this pastime, but internally he still enjoyed and relished the sweet pastime, sweet singing of Chota Haridas. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was very particular in who he would hear from. He would not let anyone uh, recite poetry or sing to him unless Saurabh Damodar had first uh, authorized it. And so he was very protective of that. Yeah. So by that we can understand that Chota Haridas was still and remained very, very dear uh, to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Okay, so before um, he committed suicide, he used to sing for right. Lord Chaitanya. And then after he committed suicide, Lord Chaitanya was remembering. No, not remembering. He was actually singing and hearing from him. Nobody else could hear it, but in the spiritual form, he was singing to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Not just remembering oh. the planet, oh. but actually after, yes. And that, that's the beautiful interaction, and that's explained in, in, this, in this chapter. Oh, okay. Thank you so much, Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Prabhuji. Thank you so much, Prabhuji. Very, very enlightening class and uh, practical lessons to be learned and applied. Always need association of devotees and guidance, and guidance means uh, love. And uh, yeah, uh, how Dhru Maharaj accepted uh, the uh, 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 instruction from Brahma. And so many nice things, Prabhuji. Thank you so much for making this pastime come alive. And then, you know, there is something that we can follow from it. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna, Mataji. Thank you. Are there any more questions for Prabhuji at this point? Hare Krishna Prabhuji, Danvi Pradam, all glories to Srila Prabhupada and Gurudev. I just uh, wanted to thank you Prabhuji so, for such a beautiful class and also the wonderful pastimes that innovated of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Chota Haridas and others just showing us how important is the concept of the, how to protect our devotional service and we cannot afford to cut slack even for a moment. Um, and that as Maya is so strong. Thank you so much, Prabhuji. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Prabhuji. Dhanu Pranam, all glories to Shri Prabhupada, all glories to Guru Maharaj. So, Prabhuji, I had a uh, query. It was a very, very beautiful class and very, like, uh, pinpointing on things that we need to really think about. So, um, when we do uh, things in Krishna consciousness, we are doing it for uh, we. W what should be that mood? Are we doing it for the pleasure of Krishna or we are we doing it for the pleasure of devotees? And 
like because why I am just answer, asking about devotees is because we say that we are not directly going to Krishna, right? We are going through devotees through the devotees only then we can reach Krishna. So what should be our mood? Are we serving Krishna? Are we doing things for the pleasure of Krishna? Or are we doing for the or like whatever is told by the devotees? What should that mood be? Well, our our, our mood should be a um, couple things. Krishna says. In um, Shin Bhagavatam, he explains that I am I am pleased by the service of my devotees, but I am more pleased by the service of my devotees to my devotees. It is more pleasing to him when we serve Krishna's devotees than when we serve him directly. So our ultimate goal is to please Krishna. We were created for only one reason. This is the ego-shattering reality. Our only existence is to be used by Krishna for his pleasure. That's it. And so, he, Krishna says, by serving my devotees, I'm more pleased. So our mood should be how I can serve the devotees. Because that pleases Krishna more. My only existence is to please Krishna. Our other mood in service should be, I have no clue how to serve Krishna. I don't know how to serve Krishna. I need to serve someone who knows how to serve Krishna. Because in the spiritual world, you know, all the, all the intimate services with Krishna are already taken. Our, our, our position is to be the servant of 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 the servant. But that service is very blissful in the material world, in the spiritual world, if we have purity of heart. But if we have this attachment to, I want to do this and I want to do that, we will not be fulfilled. So our mood in service has to be that. How I can participate in the service of Krishna by serving the devotees, serving under their instruction and guidance. And with that, we can make progress. So that is what I can offer. Thank you, Prabhuji. Prabhuji, in this case, like because we are on a we are in this material world, right? And we are thinking about the spiritual platform. But in this case, will it not be a uh, will it not come a time wherein Instead of serving a devotee, we are trying to please the devotee to get services or please the devotee to be in their good books. This is just a material uh, contamination which might haunt us or which might get contami contamination in our spiritual thinking or in a devotional mood also. Well, we have to serve the right devotees then in that situation. We have to serve devotees who don't want service but want to engage all of us in the service of Krishna. So if someone has, you know, selfish motives and I have to serve as the Buddha, that, that impurities within the consciousness. So a, a pure devotee, when you render service to them, engages one, them in the service of Krishna. Right? When Srila Prabhupada was rendering service to Bhakti Siddhanta Sothi Thakur, he said to him, Prabhupada wrote him a letter just a couple weeks before he left this planet. He said, I'm so, I'm, I'm lamenting that I have not been able to render you personal service. I am a grahasta. You are surrounded by so many sannyasi and brahmachari disciples who are able to serve you. And Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasthitaka wrote back very importantly that your service to me is to preach this message to the West. That is the service. So the mood of a devotee in receiving service is not to receive it for themselves, but to, to engage that person serving Krishna. So where there are some material motives in that, we have to you know, serve correctly, uh, serve the right types of devotees that will engage us in that service. So Prabhupada, will we understand whom we are serving is the right or how we are serving, or like because we are, we will look at everyone with the same, uh, same eye, uh, right? Like everybody is a pure devotee of the Lord. We will not try to differentiate between them. 
so like how to because if we are trying to see that who is a pure devotee who is not then again we try to differentiate and we try to compare there rather for us for us like for who are new devotees who they try to do everything which is told to them yeah so then how do we differentiate what you, you don't differentiate who is a pure devotee and who is not you don't have the eyes to see it i don't have the eyes to see that um so what 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 we do is as what you said in the very end of your question which is we take instructions from our seniors who are guiding us in the process of devotional service and we follow those instructions and whatever those may be we have faith that they have our interest of developing our spiritual life and so we don't put ourselves in a position to need to decide who is doing what in another you know who is pure who is not we cannot see we don't know so better our our situation is we find devotees that you know are guiding us in the process of devotional service and we take counsel from them how may i serve what do you recommend i do you know and that is the process of the disciple guru relationship is you know the guru guides one in the practical aspects of service Thank you Prabhu ji thank you so much yeah. Hare Krishna Hare Bol Hare Krishna Hare Krishna Hare Krishna Hare Krishna Prabhu ji Dana Pranam all glories to Shri Prabhupada and Guru Maharaj uh Prabhu ji it's very very deep uh, a uh, very nice class uh, we can feel the purity in the class uh prabhu ji uh, the question is uh, of me is uh, most of the time we are captivated by the superficial things even though in the devotional service <coughs> how we can come out from that uh, just go in deep yeah i mean the fact that you recognize that is the great fortune you have right that we recognize that my you know i am i am enamored by the the superficial aspects of the service and so you know by continuing to read uh and understand the the mood of service by our great acharyas uh we can start to apply you know that 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 right mood and when we it, it's we're going to have various attachments right i'm i'm doing this service of cooking for krishna and in that cooking process how much am i really cooking with the thought of oh i hope krishna enjoys this oh i am assisting shrimati radharani in her kitchen so that krishna will enjoy something to eat or are we have ulterior motives right so what i like to do practically after performing some service i like to do and analyze you know how much thought did i really put into that service of just trying to please krishna and just by thinking about it analyzing it doing some introspection the next time we approach that service we hope we can be a little bit more attentive a little bit more removed from those superficial aspects of devotional service and so you're you've got the great first step which is acknowledging that it's there too often you know we don't even see it um and so you know if we pray to krishna krishna help me become more centered in my service of the only goal is for you to please you you will illuminate those things and if he sends a devotee to illuminate them for you don't reject that person <laughs> you know sometimes when someone comes and corrects us or 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 clarifies a mistake we're making we our instinct is to fight back we all become shatriyas um and and fight back instead we should see oh krishna is sending somebody to show me that i'm not doing something right let me embrace that person and that message very deeply and cherish it um so so can i make it Yeah, yes, yes, Prabhuji. Thank you so much, Prabhu, for your beautiful class. Thank you, Dhanur Pranam. 
Thank you very much, Prabhuji, for such a wonderful class today. And we are very grateful to you. Mm-hmm. And we really look forward to having your association again in future. If nobody else has anybody, any, any other questions for Prabhuji, we can end the call here. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Prabhu. Very beautiful class. Hare Krishna. One shout out to the Kapsha. Shila Prabhupada Kichai. It's Krishna Prabhuji Kichai.